Perry, and she's an industry analyst of security tech at gigaom.com and is a key member of Israeli cybersecurity and hacking scene. She'll be talking about the world of hackers as manipulators of tech and the future of humans and machines. So a round of applause for Karen Elazari. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm very happy to be here. Just want to play a little something for you. And for all those standing on the side, if you want to join us, we'll be starting in 20 seconds. Don't be shy. Hi, guys. Do join in. It's a little bit of video, a short clip from the anim movie Ghost in the Shell. Has anyone here seen that movie? Do you like it? That's great. Fantastic. So thanks again for joining me this afternoon. Guys in the back row, can you hear me OK? Yeah? Perfect. Uh, my name is Karen Elazari. I'm also known as Karen E. I use three, the number three, to spell my name. So that's K3, R3, N3. And that's because hackers sometimes exchange numbers for letters. You can find me online as Karen E, K3, R3, N3, at KarenE.com or on Twitter. I want to talk to you today about hackers and how they've become both the heroes and the anti-heroes of the information age, of the 21st century where we live right now. And I'd like to start with a tribute to a fantastic lady. Some of you might know her. I actually blame Miss Angelina Jolie, the young Angelina Jolie, who uh, in 1995 starred in the movie Hackers. I saw her and, you know, that's my career choice right there. I had to follow in her footsteps and go into the security industry. That's not part of the movie, though. But it, I'm here because of two ladies. One of them is Angelina Jolie. Well, the other isn't really a lady. She's more of a cyborg, actually. This is the star of Ghost in the Shell. She's an android police officer who's fighting a networked intelligence, a new life form born out of the ether, a new entity in the information superhighway, the Ghost in the Shell. And we'll come back to that later, because when I saw that movie again, 1995, it blew my mind. It inspired me to go into the technology world and just imagine the new things, the new entities, the new technologies that are going to be born on the web. But I was also deeply inspired by science fiction. Any of you are science fiction fans? Yeah? That's right. That's great. I, I love science fiction. And you might be familiar with Arthur C. Clarke and his very famous Three Laws. Most notoriously, maybe, the, the third rule, that is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Just imagine the technologies that we have with us here today, surrounding us. It would have seemed like magic, indeed, to anyone, not just 20 years ago, but even 10 years ago, some of them, perhaps. But to be honest, it was Clark's second law, which really inspired me. This is le a lesson known law. And he says that the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Who's that other guy speaking? Is everyone hearing that or is it just, that, just me? Anyway, venturing into the impossible. And last summer, I had the privilege of working with Singularity University. Has anyone here heard of Singularity University, perhaps? I'm going to tell you a bit about it. So SU, Singularity U, it's actually not really a university. It's more a private think tank or a research center in Mountain View, California. And it's focusing on the cutting edge of technology, how it's changing, and how that technological change is affecting, positively impacting humanity. Basically venturing every day a little bit into the impossible with 3D printing technologies, with space technologies, and a lot more. So really, that's why we're all here today, because that sort of technologies and the people who imagined them, those visionaries, maybe we can even call them hackers, brought them into being. And those technologies have already deeply impacted our lives, our reality culture, politics, media, economics. So if cyberspace started out as science fiction, it's now really part of our reality. And it's a reality that we live in, where data is gathered, analyzed, collected, about us, with us, in the systems that we use all the time. We're being watched, we're being tracked, we're being analyzed. Patterns and streams of information have become the, more, the most important thing in the 21st century. So we are told that information is power, that data is power. Now I'd like to ask you, is that really the case? Because 
if our lives have become so increasingly digital, if we live in this digital realm that's claiming each and every aspect of our life, is it the information that's really the key? Or rather, the access to it? Because hackers know how to gain access to information. That's what makes them powerful. Hackers can break boundaries. And today, I'd like to ask you to consider the concept of hacking in a positive light, not necessarily a, crimin a criminal light. We'll see how being able to access, manipulate, touch information has made hackers so powerful. Just imagine, in the world of the Matrix, Neo is almost like a god because he can hack the system, because he can bend or even break some of the rules and the, the laws governing the system around, surrounding him. Neo had to take the red pill to realize what hackers and technology manipulators already know, and that is that in the man-made world of cyberspace, in the virtual realms of technology, all of the rules are just man-made. That means they can be ignored, bent, broken, manipulated at times. And this is exactly what hackers know how to do. Now, just imagine here in London, the popular Oyster cards using RFID. Imagine that a hacker with a laptop and an RFID reader can infinitely charge up their cards without really paying for it and travel for free. To anyone else, that might seem like a cheat code in a computer game, or maybe even like magic. But that's a reality today. And be just because hackers can think differently and do things like that, ignore the rules, bend the rules, break them sometimes, I think they have the power to push forward the boundaries of technology, to move ahead. And that's where they're going to be the heroes in my talk today. So these are just the names of some of the famous hacker heroes and heroines of cyberspace's very brief history. These are fictional role models and real-world infamous hackers who rose to infamy in the 80s and the 90s. If you think about it, they're almost siblings to the World Wide Web itself, right? And I find them personally to be fearsome, fascinating, and ha to have unbound capabilities. And in those era, in the 80s and the 90s, mainstream media relished in portraying these hackers as trespassers, as dangerous pranksters, perhaps, and they imagined them as capable of wreaking global havoc with just a few keystrokes. A little bit hysteric, if you ask me, but that's kind of the scenario you, that you would see in movies like War Games from 1983, right? And those, uh, the powers that be, the governments and militaries of that era, really saw hackers, when it was the height of the Cold War, as capable of very dangerous things. Programmable computers, automated control systems, computer networks, might have seemed to those old school generals like magic or very scary. And those nightmare scenarios where in a movie where a young hacker can almost start World War III freak the hell out of everyone. Now, during the same time, that very era, the 80s, hackers were becoming a reality, not just on Hollywood screens. This is the Hacker Manifesto published on online hacker zines like FRAC, if anyone's uh, heard of it, in 1986. This manifesto was written by a hacker called The Mentor. His real name was Lloyd Bankenship. And it was published online just a few days after he was arrested for computer crimes. I'd like to read a few choice inspiring words from it, if you'll bear with me. This is our world now. The world of the electron and the switch. The beauty of the board. We explore, and you call us criminals. We seek after knowledge, and you call us criminals. We exist without skin color, without nationality, without religious bias, and you call us criminal. Yes, I am a criminal. My crime is that of curiosity. I am a hacker, and this is my manifesto. Inspiring words to me, and I'm sure to many other hackers around the world. And during those years, those fast-changing decades, where technology moved ahead in leaps and bounds, hackers came together all over the world, online and offline, in forums, conferences, hacker spaces, communities, events, at places like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, at Noisebridge Hackerspace, or in Seabase in Berlin, at the Chaos Con Congress, or at DEF CON, the annual celebration of hacking, which takes place every year for 21 years in Vegas, and it sees 15,000 hackers come together. When I go there, I don't see 15,000 criminals. 
I see 15,000 people that are hungry for knowledge, that like to share their information, share their knowledge, and contribute to the progress of technology. Now, during those very years, those very decades, not only hackers came together, but computer networks and computer systems around the world also started coming together, connecting and creating interfaces into previously offline and unrelated systems. And something very interesting happened. Suddenly, those nightmare, hysterical scenarios imagined by Hollywood in 1983, where a hacker might start a global thermonuclear war. Fast forward to the 21st century, 2010, the summer of Stuxnet. No longer science fiction, no longer a Hollywood scenario, but a reality, a reality in which a piece of computer code lines written by human being, maybe a big group of human beings, is capable of affecting change in the physical realm, capable of disrupting nuclear facilities on the other side of the world. Now, those men or women that wrote that code changed the world. And they had the power to do so, because previously unconnected systems offline, off the grid, were now coming all together. And indeed, I think that now those four-star generals have kind of figured it out. They've learned how to harness the power of hacking. So right now, we already live in an era of a new multi-sided Cold War, a digital war, with militaries around the world acknowledging the fact that alongside space, air, land and sea, cyberspace is now the fifth domain of warfare. And it is a critical arena for political and cultural conflicts taking place. Indeed, these are the new, the new faces of modern militaries. And these might be young men and women just like you here today. These are America's GI cyber Joes, if you will. And they're using that, the, the very same powers of manipulating technology and accessing remote systems that were once considered magic or science fiction. Now, armies still have non-virtual weapons at play, of course. We haven't transcended completely into the digital realm. And fighter jets, like this one, for example, the uh, F-35, still reign supreme. This is the latest model of the West's air supremacy, developed by the US and the UK and designed by leading weapons manufacturer. The F-35 fighter jet is supposed to be the best air flying killing machine out there. The only problem is some powers have already gotten their hands on the specs a couple of years ago. And indeed, if you compare the version on the right, which is actually the Chinese J-20 Chengdu fighter, you'll be hard pressed to find the differences. What this means is that having a few talented hackers in your side can tip the scales of an international arms race. Now, exposed as those fighter jets might be, we may still come to miss them because those fighter jets are probably going to be the last sophisticated machines piloted by humans. Drones or UAVs, unmanned aircraft vehicles, are now all the rage, as I'm sure you've heard. And while the current models of drones and UAVs are still remotely piloted by human beings and require that kill decision, that decision to shoot, to be triggered by human being, that's not going to be the case for much longer. The next generation of drones are going to have artificial intelligence. They're going to have automated weapon system. They're going to make decisions on their own, which is a little bit of a scary scenario, if, if you ask me. But what's even scarier is that these are flying automated killing machines that can be hacked. And even right now, hackers around the world are tinkering with DIY drones, building their own versions, creating their own personal armies, if you will, uh, such as uh, this model right here. It's called the WASP, or Wi-Fi Area Surveillance Platform. A couple of American hackers built it in their garage. They used one of Uncle Sam's surplus models as the platform and instilled it with an uh, Arduino controller. controller. And the software that they've put on this device can monitor GSM phone networks or crack into your Wi-Fi. And that's, you know, it might seem very sophisticated, but they build it at, at their own homes. And I'm sure you guys can do the same. So really, it might be a question of time before hackers and other 
technology manipulators start amassing their own army, if you will, an army of drones or a personal army of robots. But to what ends? That remains to be seen. However, this man has already managed to amass his own personal army, an army of hacktivists, hacker activists, and whistleblowers. Julian Assange might be the most controversial face of the new hacktivist era. The man who started WikiLeaks under the premise that institutional privacy should be eroded in the same manner that our own personal privacy has, has been eroded by uh, far-reaching espionage programs and corrupt corporations. Now, the promise of WikiLeaks was protection by anonymity, strength in numbers, if you will. And uh, while I'm, I'm not a fan, a personal fan of Mr. Assange, I am a big fan of Mr. Benedict Cumberbatch's portrayal of Assange in an upcoming movie called The Fifth Estate. Have you heard about it? I'll, I suggest you uh, check it out because it might reveal the real story behind WikiLeaks. And in a very powerful moment in that movie, Assange quotes Oscar Wilde when he says, man is least himself when he talks in his own person, but give him a mask and he will tell you the truth. And indeed, this promise of anonymity, this premise for a lot of whistleblowers and hacktivists has been a rallying cry. And particularly, it was this mask that provided both a symbol and a practical means of anonymity for the global hacker movement known as Anonymous. And I think it's uh, crucial to discuss Anonymous in this context because they've really changed the picture, haven't they? Now, uh, advocating strength in numbers as well, this faceless legion, Anons, was actually born online. It was created in chat rooms and in image message boards, seemingly organically coming together, almost like that networked intelligence in Ghost in the Shell. Only it took a different face, the face of Alan Moore's V from V for Vendetta, the vengeful vin vigilante, an anti-hero, portraying himself or inspired himself by a real terrorist acting more than 400 years ago, the notorious Guy Fox, who conspired to blow up parliament not very far from where we stand here today. But Anons have created their own history, separate from that of V for Vendetta or Guy Fox. And in the past five years, they've already disrupted and instigated riots around the world, from London to New York, from Berlin to Benghazi. The masked masses are taking from their keyboards and to the street in support of various ideological causes and political ideas. You'll see them using controversial, illegal means, oftentimes disrupting computer systems, sabotaging them, and causing havoc. However, some might say that this is the most suitable form, perhaps, of political protest, and it's definitely a very effective media presence for today's 21st century ADHD disengaged generation. They've created something that people do relate to, and indeed, they've become the new face of this hacker political power. You've seen them around during the Arab Spring revolutions, the Occupy movement, all over the world. These are the new digital protesters for the 21st century. Commander X, a known supporter, a leader of Anons, if you could say that this legion has a leader, which it doesn't, he said he is very proud to be a member of a global internet freedom movement known as Anonymous. Others brand them as revolutionists or terrorists. Now, wherever your own personal political favors may lie, I think it's important to point out how Anonymous have given this new face and new political appeal even to hacker power. They've created this seemingly chaotic, not necessarily good or bad presence, a subversive presence, which might be seen a little bit like maybe a Robin Hood or perhaps a vicious jester. But sometimes they indeed go too far, as was the group, uh, the subgroup within Anonymous known as LALSEC, which were disrupting systems sometimes only for the lulls. And one of their very well-known leaders, nicknamed Topiary, that was his nickname, actually called uh, Jake Davis, here from the UK's own Shetland Islands, uh, was their Twitter bard, or a hacker poet, if you will. 
using his Twitter presence uh, to send out insidious messages to anonymous and lolsex millions of followers worldwide. Now, just before he was arrested two years ago, he managed to put out this tweet. You cannot arrest an idea. This is, of course, paraphrasing the, the concept from V for Vendetta, that an idea cannot be killed. And indeed, this idea of anonymous, of hacktivism, has already taken root, regardless of the personal fates of anonymous members. And we have new hacker icons right now, perhaps uh, like the first hacker martyr, Mr. Aaron Schwartz. Aaron Schwartz tragically took his own life a few months ago, earlier this year, faced with federal prosecution for alleged computer crimes he committed in the United States. The allegations were that he downloaded countless academic articles from MIT. You might even compare that to a crime of curiosity. Now, while his death was indeed tragic and sad, the reaction to it and the popular voices that have been heard afterwards really signify this change of approach towards hackers in the popular opinion, now being seen as symbols of a new hacker ethic, moving forward to try and maybe change, revitalize the fossilized rules and approaches of how society right now views technology. And while there's been countless debates and discussions about the own personal fate of Snowden or Assange, or even uh, uh, of other anonymous uh, members being prosecuted, these debates sometimes miss the point because they lose sight of what these hacktivists, these whistleblowers discovered about what's happening to us, what's happening to democracy in light of these far-reaching espionage program. That might be the real story here, not the story of whether these men or women my, are prosecuted and spend time in jail. Now, these icons might be controversial, but they don't stand alone. There's a new wave right now of hacktivism which strives for parliamentary representation. Pirate parties, political parties around the world trying to get into parliament and influence politics from within with agendas of personal data privacy, a change of approach to copyright law, and a direct democracy model. It might be too early to tell uh, with regards to how successful these new parties are, but I think it's only the beginning of the game. And as they are trying to influence this old school system from within, we should uh, lend them our voice if, if we care about our digital futures. Now, alongside these political pirate, uh, parties, there's also a crypto party, which is a fantastic example of a grassroots movement. Anyone here heard about crypto party or perhaps participated at some of the events? The crypto party movement is a grassroots gathering of people all over the world. It's a network of events, really. Anyone could hold them or organize them, where concerned citizens learn from each other basic computer security skills, but more importantly, cryptography skills designed to protect their digital information. It's an act of digital self-empowerment for concerned civilians, trying to balance out, perhaps, that all-seeing, all-powerful big brother. Another fantastic example of how the web and hacker culture can democratize even the most central of things is Bitcoin. Has anyone here traded Bitcoin or bought some Bitcoin, mining maybe some Bitcoins? Bitcoin, I think, is fantastic because uh, it's been around since 2009 and it's an open source, peer-to-peer -peer form of digital currency. Now, there's already several different alternative payment systems out there. I think Bitcoin will be seen in the future perhaps as the MySpace of digital payments, just the first sparrow uh, telling us about what's to come. And since we depend so much of technology, why not wear it, embed it, implant it? And by that, of course, give even more power to those very innovative tech companies that are creating new interfaces between us and our technology, const constantly blurring the line between the born and the made. Now, these are, of course, technologies that can and will be hacked in the future. But the next frontier might be hacking the body and the human mind realizing that biology is made of information processes. It's an operating system of neurons and cells. And if we start looking at genetic codes or in the way our body works as software, then we realize that that too can be hacked, manipulated, and yes, even 
upgraded as uh, this uh, real Blade Runner, if you will, demonstrated. He's the, the South African athlete Oscar Pistorius sparked our imaginations when using these pair of um, blades, really, uh, lack of another term, he managed to become one of the fastest runners out there over performing regular athletes, proving that being uh, disabled doesn't really have to be a, dis a disadvantage. Now, really, there's a, lot of such, uh, a bunch of other such pioneers. One other example is the UK's own Professor Kevin Warwick, otherwise known as Captain Cyborg from the University of Reading. This professor has performed uh, experiments with RFID chips and with uh, robotic arms. He's used brain gates to send commands to rem remotely connected robotic arms, or even to send signals to his wife using uh, emotions over IP, if you will. Now, those brain gates that he used to communicate are really testing the boundaries of how we as humans are going to communicate with technologies. And I'm certain that his research will influence us all in coming years. Uh, there's another British cyborg I'd like to tell you about, a Ms. Left Anonym. Maybe some of you have met her. This unique, really outstanding young woman uh, describes herself as a faceless, genderless British wetware hacker who likes people, science, and practical transhumanism. Now, she has performed at home do-it-yourself experiments, medical exper experiments on herself. She's implanted RFID chips, of course, to control her computer, but even more than that, she has metal discs in the tips of her fingers, allowing her a sense of magnetic fields, or uh, she calls it uh, uh, new sensory organs for magnetic radiation. Now, kids, don't try this at home. Uh, instead, try it at the next hacker conference you're going to. Because only last month at DEF CON, a couple of hackers demonstrated in front of a live audience how they can implant easily RFID chips into the hand of a uh, honest volunteer, perhaps drunk volunteer, but he's, he's doing well right now with his RFID chips. And they don't stand alone. At another hacker conference, uh, TourCon in, near Seattle in uh, Washington, California, this gentleman, Amal Grafstra, who's a pioneer of RFID chips, implanted eight more volunteers with RFID chips. For $30 and a signed liability waiver, of course, you can get a chip as well. Now, this guy already has two of those. He uses them to access his computer, turn on his motorbike, access the safe in his house, and of course, authenticate into his mobile phone. And he's been doing this for almost 10 years now. So RFID chips within our bodies are not science fiction anymore, far from it. Now, of course, medical technology, which is embedded within our bodies, is scary. And it can also be quite dangerous. Security researchers discovered in 2008, as late as, two as early as 2008, that uh, implanted defibrillators, pacemakers, and other embedded medical devices can indeed be hacked using radio frequency. They have uh, demonstrated that they can cause these devices to send charges, potentially lethal results to the person with that medical uh, technology within them. And a security researcher named Barnaby Jack demonstrated last year that he can hack into an insulin pump. If, I don't know if you know these or if you have these models here in the UK of implanted insulin pumps that are automatically release insulin into the bloodstream. Barnaby Jack demonstrated that he can remotely instruct such a pump to dump the remaining insulin in its reservoir onto the bloodstream of the, the person wearing that. Again, potentially lethal results. Now, he did this as part of his security research, in a security research in an attempt to show medical companies how seriously they have to take these devices. And indeed, the United States uh, Government Accountability Office also published a report last year talking about the security of medical devices, urging the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, to look into these and make sure that implanted medical devices are secure. Now, last month, Barnaby Jack, that same researcher, was scheduled to deliver a demonstration of remote hacking of pacemakers. Uh, he claimed to have found exploits and tools that enable him to create that sort of a shock in a pacemaker remotely. Sadly, he died in mysterious incidents a few days before his presentation, and we're not sure what happened there. But a few days after his untimely death, 
this application, Android app, came out, was released. It's an uh, Android app called Pace Exploit APK. Oh, APK is the Android app file, of course. And the people who released it claim they're doing so in the honor of Barnaby Jack. They said they found the same exploits, the same techniques, and have managed to put those on an Android phone app uh, for anyone to really try and use. And they published it online. Now, this is a very, very scary thought indeed. Fortunately, it was revealed as a hoax. It was a social experiment by a couple of security researchers who wanted to see how many people might download such an app and push the button. Apparently, a few did. Now, again, like I said earlier, the next frontiers of hacking might be our brains. And neuroscientists and neurohackers are already working on methods to manipulate or perhaps even record our brainwaves using magnetic uh, uh, resonance imaging, using electricity pulses. They're trying to cure illnesses like Parkinson's or mental illnesses like depression. But what if they could read our minds and get into our thoughts? Well, that's a bit scary, isn't it? And I, I'm not sure what the future might bring, but many of these technologies, embedded devices, brain gates, DIY implants, already featured in those cyberpunk and science fiction novels I grew up on in the 80s. Works of fiction like William Gibson's Neuromancer, or Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, or of course Stevenson's Snow Crash, are quickly becoming a reality, perhaps even faster than we realize. Now, whatever this digital future might hold, it's not going to become less digital. It's only increasingly more virtual. And in these new frontiers, in the information age, hacking and hackers have a new form of power. So perhaps we can start looking at them at a different light. Although hackers do operate often outside of mainstream society, and they have their own code of ethics and moral compass, perhaps, they might be seen as part of a thriving subculture that's pushing forward the technologies that we use. And if some see them as the villains of the information age, maybe we could also come to see them as the masked heroes. Indeed, I believe that the popular perception of hackers, which has been a famously ambiguous and misrepresented term, needs to change. And right now, all over the world, you're hearing about people that are hacking for good, using hacking as a metaphor for solving complicated technical issues with a creative, out-of-the-box attitude. You're hearing about hacking financial technology, hacking education, even hacking the environment. So I call upon you to try and embrace those same ideas and same uh, uh, methods of thinking and hack the planet. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Now, uh, before uh, we move ahead, or as we move ahead for some questions, I'm very happy to take questions from uh, the audience. I believe we have mics ready for you guys. We do indeed. Yeah, don't be shy, even you there in the back row. Any questions, guys? Hands up. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me, you're very welcome to do so via Twitter, K3R3N3, or from, uh, from my website, K3R3N3.com. And while you think of a couple of questions, I'm going to let you get a copy of that. Uh, by the way, the image in the background is ASCII art. Anyone here a fan of ASCII art? I love it. Uh, I know. <laughs> it's a bit silly, isn't it? Uh, and here are some uh, inspiring pictures and funny cats, because uh, <laughs> it would be absolutely remiss of me not to have any funny cats. Yeah, do we have a question? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, yeah, right there in the third row, I believe. Hello there. Hi. Um, the question that I've got really is just um, about my university, really, because I'm going to be um, in September later this month, uh, starting my third year at Birmingham City University, and um, I want to do a project on exploring wireless uh, vulnerabilities, and just wondered what sort of advice you'd give, or any tips, or just you know what. What's your point of view on that, really? Yeah, sure. So the question was uh, if I can give any advice or tips with regards to researching wireless vulnerabilities. And as the gentleman noted, he's doing so as part of his academic uh, study. Of course, not to any nefarious or illegal uh, uh, methods or, or um, 
targets. So uh, a few things about wireless. Uh, one cool thing is that you don't really have to start from a clean slate because a lot of you know, really cool people have already done a lot of research. And I would definitely recommend using and testing those uh, boundaries of uh, hacking wireless networks using all kinds of embedded technologies like uh, using mobile phones that have a wireless card. There's a really cool company in the United States called uh, Pony Express. I don't know if you heard about it. Pony like P-W-N, like owning, not like a pony horse. And Pony Express developed several very interesting Wi-Fi hacking platforms for the security research community to use. So that's a really cool uh, uh, tool that you can try and uh, play with. They've created the type of um, electric um, adapter, something that looks like an electric adapter that you can just put in the wall. But in fact, it already has a complete Wi-Fi hacking platform coded into it. Uh, it's a it's, they use a distribution of, of Linux, which they uh, adopted. So that could be a cool tool that you can play around with. Of course, only hacking your own uh, networks. If it's not yours, don't sniff it. That's what we usually say. And uh, a very basic tool for uh, wireless security is, of course, Wireshark, which I assume you might be familiar with. To those of you in the audience that aren't, Wireshark is a very easy to use tool. You can use it on both the PC platform or uh, Linux, and I'm sure there's some Mac version of it, to sniff your own network at home or at the university lab and see what you can find out on that network and play around with filters and settings. It's a lot of fun. Another tool uh, I would recommend for other people as well looking into security research is a Linux distribution called Backtrack, which is in fact a, a Linux distribution you can run from a CD, a thumb drive, or install on your uh, PC or Mac. And it has all of the tools that security testers use, including Wi-Fi testing, exploits, and other uh, techniques that uh, we in the security industry use for pen testing or penetration testing. I hope that's helpful for you. Yes, thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. Don't hold the mic. Any more questions? Anybody, hands up. Yeah, know. another one, second row. Come on, a side section, yeah, OK. Hi. <laughs> Don't let them take all the time. Yes? Uh, so the, the book that we're referring to earlier, sort of Snow Crash, New Romancer, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, they all describe sort of anarcho-capitalist dystopian futures where economies have failed, bands of roaming hackers defend the world, etc., etc. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it seems to me that groups like uh, Anonymous, Lulsec, the sort of hacktivist community, are effectively presupposing the world of cyberpunk before it actually exists. Before it actually exists. Do, do you think, perhaps, that these communities are, are creating the risk of creating a self uh, perpetuating future that they even in their own actions are creating the dystopian future that they wish not to exist? Very interesting question there. So uh, the question is uh, basically whether those hacktivists and hackers around the world right now are actually maybe bringing forth that dystopian cyberpunk future of science fiction movies and, and books in their actions. Something along those lines, did I get it right? So uh, personally I believe that while most of those science fiction uh, and cyberpunk novels are extremely dystopian, they're not that far off from what we have today. If you think about it, uh, a couple of big tech companies hoard all of the data in the world. They know everything about you and they share that information with governments. And you know, in some places around the world, uh, democracy is, seems to be maybe a little bit crumbling behind and corporates come in to do what governments can't. So we're not that far off. Uh, it's true that maybe some of those hackers or hacktivists are operating under an ideological view of the world, which is more dark and dystopian than uh, what we have here. You know, definitely here at this event is more of a celebration of digital culture. Yeah, we're not afraid of technology. We're not afraid of the dark aspects of it. So I really don't believe we're at risk uh, by those hackers creating that reality. I do believe we are at risk of becoming that cyberpunk dystopia because of some of the powers that be that are already uh, out there in the world. Not necessarily those uh, hacktivists like Anonymous, though. Thank you for the question. And yeah, uh, one over there, and there was one over here as well. Uh, yes, hello. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your conference. It was very interesting. Uh, my question is about, I want to know your opinion about uh, my concern. Uh, for sure, you know what happened this year in DEFCON 21. They asked the feds to stay away. Yeah. 
What do you think about interaction between uh, governors, law enforcers, uh, and hackers? Well, you know, that's a fantastic question. So for those of you that are not uh, as knowledgeable as that gentleman, at the last DEF CON event, DEF CON 21, uh, just uh, in July, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the founder of the conference, a hacker known as the Dark Tangent, uh, who for years has been encouraging the feds which is a colloquial name for government agents of various uh, countries and agencies to come to DEF CON. This year, he actually wrote a, in a letter saying, maybe we need some time apart, uh, mostly because of the far-reaching uh, espionage programs uh, of the NSA that were uncovered by Edward Snowden, which really created this kind of a rift between the Fed community and the hacker community. Now, there's always been mistrust and questions of uh, you know, transparency between the Fed's communities and uh, the hacker world. I think that we right now stand uh, on the cusp of a change of approach. And I'm hopeful, very, very hopeful, that both the hackers uh, that see themselves as anti-government learn how to communicate uh, better with those feds and, for instance, try to influence government, like the pirate parties are doing, trying to work from within and change the system if they don't like it. On the other hand, I think the feds really have to maybe do some trust building steps in order to be welcomed again into uh, the um, very open, usually, atmosphere of DEF CON. And uh, yes, please, gentlemen, all the way in the back. You know, I had a slide about that. So that's a really good question. The problem is, I don't know where that slide is now. I'll try and find it. Yeah? First of all, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. My, My question goes back, goes to your slide about privacy and the assumed right to privacy in the, in the new digital economy. My question is about people who are digital users but not digitally literate, which is increasing as information goes on, the, um, big data gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And my question is, how can a, a hacktivist society exist when all this information is available? And how do you maintain the right of privacy when it's essentially available for anybody to take? Yeah. Like, how can we have that, say, as a community that we want privacy as, a, as an assumed right, mm -hmm. and yet be uh, allow, want to it further hacktivism? Well, uh, fantastic question, although a little bit, uh, <laughs> maybe lacking a bit of focus, but I'll try, I'll try to bring it together. So you're asking in the current era, in the digital society, is it even valid to ask for personal privacy? Does it make sense? And how can hacktivists, you know, claim that they deserve personal privacy? And how can we help those people that are less literate about the dig digital world get their own privacy? Is that about right? Yeah? Okay. So... Uh, Honestly, personally, I think that the privacy of your own data is not just something that you claim. It's something you have to kind of create. You have to maintain it. You have to be responsible in the way that you use technology. And it's true. How can we expect people that are just now coming into the wired world to realize that everything that they do online is tracked and monitored? Uh, I think that movements like the crypto party is one fantastic example of how uh, the more literate, the more digitally literate people, uh, the hackers or the cypherpunks, the people that are into cryptography, are teaching those skills to the less literate. And a lot remains to be done on that aspect with similar movements like that. Again, I think uh, there's a role to be played here by the pirate parties around the world that uh, can focus their efforts on digital privacy and not just on, you know, let's download a lot of files for free because that's just one aspect of their political agenda. It's a difficult question. And some people are saying that in the 21st uh, century, in the information age, we don't really have privacy anymore. Maybe, and I'm willing to accept that maybe, maybe as part of our evolution into the digital world, we are going to have to let some of those concerns and expectations of privacy leave those behind. So it's a bit of a dystopian answer, I'm afraid, but uh, it's a good point that you make. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, all the way back there in the, by the speakers. Hi. Hi yeah. My question is, uh, how can we trust uh, how can we trust the cryptography? AES was a shoes by NSA, for example, and uh, how can we trust it? Okay, so uh, fantastic. AES, for example, uh, 
the, uh, the first um, deaths, for example, uh, have vulnerabilities known by the NSA 20 years uh, before they discovered publicly. Yeah. So your question is actually about cryptography. And what you mentioned, and which is right, actually, by the way, if you don't know, a lot of the cryptographic algorithms that are widely used today, like RSA, DES, and other cryptographic algorithms, have actually been either developed by uh, governments, tested by governments, or knowingly vulnerable to some governments. It's true. There are alternatives. So one solution to the problem that you pose is using alternative crypto, uh, maybe systems like the PGP, pretty good privacy, or GPG, uh, using the Blowfish algorithm. There's a bunch of other uh, crypto algorithms out there. One of the problems with these uh, more alternative crypto algorithms is that they're notoriously hard to use. So I would call upon you as a knowledgeable user, maybe as a hacker, to try and create a crypto system which is easy to use by people that are not as perhaps as knowledgeable as you are, but still uses a form of algorithm that hasn't been uh, broken. That's quite a challenge for you, oh, I, I know. But it's a worthy challenge, I think you'll agree. And uh, again, this is a, a call for arms for developers to work on better and stronger crypto. In a sense, when we're talking about crypto, we have to be honest and say that it's a race, right? Because cryptography is only as strong as the computing power that's out there in the world that can break it. And if we reach an era of quantum computing and uh, uh, mega clusters of distributed computers that are capable of breaking even the most sophisticated algorithms, you know, we, we might get there. So we have to keep producing new technology as well. But thank you for the question. I love crypto. I used to do a lot of work in the public key infrastructure and I was such a believer. Yep. Any more questions, guys? Yeah, here, front row. I look up that slide for that gentleman. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for such a great talk. My pleasure. Um, I'm just curious, I think uh, one thing that I always wonder about is uh, what's, what do you consider in your, in your opinion to be an appropriate level of paranoia for the <laughs> modern age? So, I mean, it does, I, I find myself sort of walking this line of, you know, am I, am I getting into tinfoil hat territory or, or am I not concerned enough? Yeah. And so I'd, I'd like to know how you delineate, where, where you draw the line between like I'm going a bit bananas and I'm acting in a rational and socially responsible <laughs> way. That's a fantastic question. So just to repeat the question of how paranoid should we really be? And when, when are we crossing the line into tinfoil territory, as you so aptly put it? So I used to think that I was too paranoid. And that's the sad truth. Many of the things that I thought to be impossible or very hard to do have been proven to just be child's play to either talented hackers or spying governments. So perhaps uh, my message is that you cannot be too paranoid, but again, we have to use technology, right? If you want to be completely protected, go live in a village in the north of Wales, grow some sheep, don't have any reception, any internet, no cable, no TV, uh, don't get any services from the government, right? No utilities, electricity, health, uh, home educate your kids. Yes, you'll be very safe, but you'll be left in the past century. Right? So it's part of our lives, part of the digital world, that we have to partake here and we have to be watchful and mindful of how we use technology, be responsible ab about it. Don't lose your heads you know, over it. I know, I mean, um, to give you an example of what might be too paranoid behavior, and this is something that uh, a hacker that's breaking the law might do, as some hackers run their entire operating system uh, from a card, a memory card, one like this maybe, an SD card, and then in the chance that they might get arrested or their laptop gets seized, they'll swallow this card and eat it. So I think that's a little bit too paranoid. And if you're doing that, you're probably breaking the law and you don't want to get caught in the first place. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. Don't swallow your SD cards. They'll give you terrible nightmares. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if um, if you'd like to perhaps comment on the validity of uh, cryptography in the current day and age where, for example, in this country, if you have an encrypted drive, you're obliged to hand over the keys under certain situations. Yeah. And I think I heard recently as well, um, at an airport, um, they're able to take any device you have, yeah. and make a copy of it, of any of the, your data, without a warrant, regardless of whether it's encrypted yeah, or so not. 
So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what, what the actual sort of validity of encryption is in, in the case where you can actually be coerced by someone or your government to actually hand over that data anyway. Yeah, that's a you know, fair point. So how strong is cryptography when we're forced to give away our you know, our drives, as it were. But it's also true that, like that gentleman in the back row said, how, how smart is using crypto if the government can just go ahead and break it, right? So those are difficult questions, which is why I believe uh, if we continue on this uh, kind of cat and mouse game of how am I hiding myself better, how am I storing my files in a more secure crypto environment, uh, maybe we have to really work on the political sphere and the civil sphere and change those laws, change those regulations, change those powers, those authorities, those far-reaching authorities that let the big brother, you know, take everything. Maybe that might be a little bit more useful. And of course, I would still advocate practicing personal hygiene, you know, personal security, not leaving your computers uh, at the hands of who knows which travel security authority agent, uh, not carrying completely illegal stuff with you when you go across the border, might be a good tip. Uh, maybe swallow your SD card if you're that concerned. Uh, <laughs> but uh, some salt, ketchup maybe. But honestly, you, you do raise this uh, serious problem. It is an issue. And, and the authorities do differ around the world, but it kind of seems like a lot of these Western democracies moving a little bit to the dark side, isn't it? We're practicing overreaching uh, authorities, and that's definitely uh, a bit scary, which is why I believe hacktivism, political parties, crypto parties might be the answer, not just a technical answer, but a civil answer as well. Uh, do we have time for more questions? Yeah, there's the one here, a shy one. <laughs> and maybe one o over there, okay. So uh, if one of you is an athlete, there's one all the way up there as well. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, talking about the privacy, uh, where can we find information on how to protect our privacy, our data, keep us anonymous on the internet as yeah. the crypto parties Great. that you yeah. talked about? Great question. So resources for digital privacy online. One fantastic resource is the EFF, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And uh, it's a US-based organization but they uh, do things globally. I do think I have, a, I have a slide with their logo. Let me try and find that for you, but it's EFF. And uh, they also collaborate with DEF CON and other hacker conferences around the world uh, quite often. Where is that? Okay, never mind. I'll figure it out later. Uh, so the EFF is one fantastic uh, resource, their site. Uh, attrition, attrition.org, A-T-T. R-I-T-I-O-N dot org is a wonderful hacker resources website. Yeah. Uh, again, the crypto party movement is a good source of information. Uh, I suggest you check out PGP, which is pretty good privacy. Uh, although that is already uh, not an open source crypto system. It's owned by a megacorp. So if you're uh, not a fan of mega corporations, maybe uh, try an alternative crypto algorithm. Yeah, cheers. Sorry for the short answer. Yeah, all the way up there. Yeah, hello. Hiya. Um, I have a question from, from another area, actually. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, access to the brain. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's an area that, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't need any hardware. It's actually happening. We are hacking in each other's brains. Uh, basically, uh, the way we're thinking is, is, a, is a programming. It, it's basically uh, we're running on programs. And um, we can change that. And do you think this area is also interested? Uh, is uh, might be interested, interesting for for hackers as well. Do yeah, yeah, definitely. So the question was, aren't we actually hacking each other's minds when we talk, when we experience the world, you know, without any electronic hardware? Uh, so uh, I would like to tell you that actually right now there's a very uh, I don't know powerful or very hip trend in Silicon Valley about mindfulness. And a lot of the tech companies have started to create meditation rooms. And uh, companies are developing iPhone apps that can somehow measure your uh, gamma brain waves and see if you're reaching that point of uh, you know, silent meditation where your brain is acting more efficiently and you're thinking more clearly. Uh, so I think there's a bunch of hackers out there that are 
are interested in experimenting with that as well. How can we test what our mind is going through? Can we somehow upgrade our ability to concentrate using technology that enhances our meditation techniques or our mindfulness uh, techniques? And really, uh, to be honest, neural hacking and uh, thought hacking, mind hacking is kind of like the the current frontier or maybe the bleeding edge. Uh, there's a fantastic Israeli hacker who became a neuroscientist and he's now a doctor. He's working in uh, one of the universities in California. His name is Moran Self, uh, C-E-R-F. And if you're interested in brain hacking, uh, he's got some fantastic talks, I think a TED talk or you it's on YouTube anyway. And I recommend you check it out as well. Cheers. Okay, thank you. I think that's all the time we have. My but pleasure. Thank you very much, Karen, for your fascinating talk on hackers and more. A round of applause for Karen Elizabeth. Thanks. Hack the planet. So we'll have a five-minute break, and at four, we'll have um, Peter Van Eyck on why cloud computing is the third biggest disruptive innovation. Thank you.